Chapter Twenty Nine of the House of the Wolfings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The House of the Wolfings by William Morris. Chapter Twenty Nine of Theodolf's Storm. The Goths tarried not over their victory. They shot with all the bowmen they had against the Romans on the wall, and therewith arrayed themselves to fall on once more. And Theodolf, now that the foe were covered by a wall, though it was but a little one, sent a message to the men of the third battle, them of Upmark, to wit, to come forward in good array and help to make a ring around the wolfing stead, wherein they should now take the Romans as a beast is taken in a trap. Meanwhile, until they came, he sent other men to the wood, to bring tree bowls to batter the gate, and to make bridges whereby to swarm over the wall, which was but breast-high on the Roman side, though they had worked at it ceaselessly since yesterday morning. In a long half-hour, therefore, the horns of the men of Upmark sounded, and they came forth from the wood, a very great company, for with them also were the men of the stay-at-homes and the homeless such of them as were fit to bear arms. Amongst these went the hall son, surrounded by a band of the warriors of Upmark, and before her was borne her namesake, the Lamp, as a sign of assured victory. But these stay-at-homes with the hall son were stayed by the command of Theodolf on the crown of the slope above the dwellings, and stood round about the speech hill, on the topmost of which stood the hall son and the wondrous Lamp, and the men who warded her and it. When the Romans saw the new host come forth from the wood, they might well think that they would have work enough to do that day. But when they saw the hall son take her stand on the speech hill with the men-at-arms about her, and the lamp before her, then dread of the gods fell upon them, and they knew that the doom had gone forth against them. Nevertheless, they were not men to faint and die because the gods were become their foes, but they were resolved rather to fight it out to the end against whatsoever might come against them, as was well seen afterwards. Now they had made four gates to their garth, according to their custom, and at each gate within was there a company of their mightiest men, and each was beset by the best of the markmen. Theodolf and his men beset the western gate where they had made that fierce onset, and the northern gate was beset by the Elkings and some of the kindreds of the Nethermark, and the eastern gate by the rest of the men of Nethermark, and the southern gate by the kindreds of Upmark. All this the Romans noted, and they saw how the markmen were now very many, and they knew that they were men no less valiant than themselves, and they perceived that Theodolf was a wise captain, and in less than two hours' space, from the storm of dawning, they saw those men coming from the wood with plenteous store of tree-trunks to bridge their ditch and rampart, and they considered how the day was yet very young, so that they might look for no shelter from the night-tide, and as for any aid from their own folk at the wargarth aforesaid, they hoped not for it, nor had they sent any messenger to the captain of the garth, nor did they know as yet of his overthrow on the ridge. Now, therefore, there seemed to be but two choices before them, either to abide within the rampart they had cast up, or to break out like valiant men, and either die in the storm, or cleave a way through, whereby they might come to their kindred and their stronghold southeast of the mark. This last way then they chose, or, to say the truth, it was their chief captain who chose it for them, though they were nothing loath thereto, for this man was a mucker, yet hot-headed, unstable, and naught wise in war, and heretofore had his greed minished his courage. Yet now, being driven into a corner, he had courage enough and to spare, but utterly lacked patience, for it had been better for the Romans to have abided one or two onsets from the Goths, whereby they who should make the onslaught would at least have lost more men than they on whom they should fall, before they within stormed forth on them. But their pride took away from the Romans their last chance. But their captain, now that he perceived, as he thought, that the game was lost, and his life came to its last hour, wherein he would have to leave his treasure 
and pleasure behind him grew desperate and therewith most fierce and cruel so all the captives whom they had taken there were but two score and two for the wounded men they had slain he caused to be bound on the chairs of the high seat clad in their war gear with their swords or spears made fast to their right hands and their shields to their left hands and he said that the goths should now hold a thing wherein they should at last take counsel wisely and abstain from folly for he caused store of faggots and small wood smeared with grease and oil to be cast into the hall that it might be fired so that it and the captives should burn up altogether so said he shall we have a fair torch for our funeral fire for it was the custom of the romans to burn their dead thus then he did and then he caused men to do away with the barriers and open all the four gates of the new-made garth after he had manned the wall with the slingers and bowmen and slain the horses so that the woodland folk should have no gain of them then he arrayed his men at the gates and about them duly and wisely and bade those valiant footmen fall on the goths who were getting ready to fall on them and to do their best but he himself armed at all points took his stand at the man's door of the hall and swore by all the gods of his kindred that he would not move a foot's length from thence either for fire or for steel so fiercely on that fair morning burned the hatred of men about the dwellings of the children of the wolf of the goths wherein the children of the wolf of rome were shut up as in a penfold of slaughter meanwhile the hall son standing on the hill of speech beheld it all looking down into the garth of war for the new wall was no hindrance to her sight because the speech hill was high and but a little way from the great roof and indeed she was within shot of the roman bowmen though they were not very deft in shooting so now she lifted up her voice and sang so that many heard her for at this moment of time there was a lull in the clamor of battle both within the garth and without even as it happens when the thunderstorm is just about to break on the world that the wind drops dead and the voice of the leaves is hushed before the first great and near flash of lightning glares over the fields so she sang now the latest hour cometh and the ending of the strife and to-morrow and to-morrow shall we take the hand of life and wend adown the meadows and skirt the darkling wood and reap the waving acres and gather in the good i see a wall before me built up of steel and fire and hurts and heartsick striving and the war rites fierce desire but there amidst a door is and windows are therein and the fair sunlit meadows and the houses of the kin smile on me through the terror my trembling life to stay that at my mouth now flutters as fain to flee away lo e'en as the little hammer and the blowpipe of the right about the flickering fire deals with the silver white and the cup and its beauty groweth that shall be for the people's feast and all men are glad to see it from the greatest to the least e'en so is the tale now fashioned that many a time and oft shall be told on the acres edges when the summer eve is soft shall be hearkened round the hall blaze when the midwinter night the kindred's mirth besetteth and quickeneth man's delight and we that have lived in the story shall be born again and again as men feast on the bread of our earning and praise the grief-born grain as she made an end of singing those about her understood her words that she was foretelling victory and the peace of the mark and for joy they raised a shrill cry and the warriors who were nighest to her took it up and spread it through the whole host round about the garth and went up into the breath of the summer morning and went down the wind along the meadow of the wolfings so that they of the wainberg who were now drawing somewhat near to wolfstead heard it and were glad but the romans when they heard it knew that the heart of the battle was reached and they cast back that shout wrathfully and fiercely and made toward the foe therewithal those mighty men fell on each other in the narrow passes of the garth for fear was dead and buried in that battle of the morning 
On the north gate, Hyarandai of the Elkings was the point of the markman's wedge, and first clave the Roman press. In the eastern gate it was Valtire, Otter's brother's son, a young man and most mighty. In the south gate it was Gerbald of the Shieldings, the messenger. In the west gate, Theodolf the war duke gave one mighty cry like the roar of an angry lion, and cleared a space before him for the wielding of Ivar's blade, for at that moment he had looked up to the roof of the kindred, and beheld a little stream of smoke curling blue out of a window thereof and he knew what had betided, and how short was the time before them. But his wrathful cry was taken up by some who had beheld that same sight, and by others who saw naught but the Roman press, and terribly it rang over the swaying, struggling crowd. Then fell the first rank of the Romans before those stark men and mighty warriors, and they fell even where they stood, for on either side could any give back but for a little space, so close the press was and the men so eager to smite. Neither did any crave peace, if he were hurt or disarmed, for to the gods it was but a little thing to fall in hot blood in that hour of love of kindred, and longing for the days to be. And for the Romans they had had no mercy, and now looked for none, and they remembered their dealings with the gods, and saw before them as it were, once more, yea, as in a picture, their slayings and quellings and lashings and cold mockings which they had dealt out to the conquered foemen without mercy. And now they longed sore for the quiet of the dark, when their hard lives should be over, and all these deeds forgotten, and they and their bitter foes should be at rest for ever. Most valiantly they fought, but the fury of their despair could not deal with the fearless hope of the gods, and as rank after rank of them took the place of those who were hewn down by Theodolf and the kindred, they fell in their turn, and slowly the goths cleared a space within the gates, and then began to spread along the wall within, and grew thicker and thicker. Nor did they fight only at the gates, but made them bridges of those tree trunks, and fell to swarming over the rampart till they had cleared it of the bowmen and slingers. Then they leaped down and fell upon the flanks of the Romans, and the host of the dead grew, and the host of the living lessened. Moreover the stay-at-homes round about the speech hill, and that band of the warriors of Upmark who were with them beheld the great roof, and saw the smoke come gushing out of the windows, and at last saw the red flames creep out amidst it, and wave around the window jams like little banners of scarlet cloth. Then they could no longer refrain themselves, but ran down from the speech hill and the slope about it with great and fierce cries, and clomb the wall where it was unmanned, and helping each other with hand and back, both stark warriors and old men and lads and women, and thus they gat them into the garth and fell upon the lessening band of the Romans, who now began to give way hither and thither about the garth as they best might. Thus it befell at the west gate, but at the other gates it was no worser, for there was no diversity of valour between the houses. Nay, whereas the more part and the best part of the Romans faced the onset of Theodolf, which seemed to them the main onset, they were somewhat easier to deal with elsewhere than at the west gate. And at the east gate was the place first won, so that Valtire and his folk were the first to clear a space within the gate, and to tell the tale shortly, for can this that and the other sword-stroke be told of in such a medley. They drew the death-ring around the Romans that were before them, and slew them all to the last man, and then fell fiercely on the rearward of them of the north gate, who still stood before Hyarandai's onset. There again was no long tale to tell of, for Hyarandai was just winning the gate, and the wall was cleared of the Roman shot-fighters, and the markmen were standing on the top thereof, and casting down on the Romans, spears and bulks of wood and whatsoever would fly there again were the romans all slain or put out of the fight and the two bands of the kindred joined together and with what voices the battle rage had left them cried out for joy and fared on together to help bind the sheaves of war which theodolf's sickle had reaped and now it was mere slaying and the romans though they still fought in knots of less than a score yet fought on, and hewed, and thrust, without more thought or will than the stone when it leaps adown the hillside after it has first been set a-going. By now the garth was fairly won, and Theodolf saw 
as there was no hope for the Romans drawing together again. So while the kindreds were busied in hewing down those knots of desperate men, he gathered to him some of the wisest of his warriors. Among them were Steinulf and Granny the Grey, the Deathwoods rites, but Atholif had been grievously hurt by a spear and was out of the battle, and drave away through the confused turmoil which still boiled on the garth there, and made straight for the man's door of the hall. Soon he was close there too, having hewn away all fleers that hindered him, and the doorway was before him. But on the threshold, the fire and flames of the kindled hall behind him, stood the Roman captain, clad in gold-adorned armor, and a surcoat of sea-born purple. The man was cool and calm and proud, and a mocking smile was on his face, and he bore his bright blade unbloodied in his hand. Theodolf stayed a moment of time, and their eyes met. It had gone hard with the war duke, and those eyes glittered in his pale face, and his teeth were close set together, though he had fought wisely and for life, as he who is most valiant ever will do, till he is driven to bay like the lone wood wolf by the hounds, yet had he been sore mishandled. His helm and shield were gone, his hauberk rent, for it was no dwarf wrought coat, but the work of Ivar's hand. The blood was running down from his left arm, and he was hurt in many places. He had broken Ivar's sword in the medley, and now bore in his hand a strong Roman short sword, and his feet stood bloody on the worn earth, anigh the man's door. He looked into the scornful eyes of the Roman lord for a little minute, then laughed aloud, and therewithal, leaping on him with one spring, turned sideways and dealt him a great buffet on his ear with his unarmed left hand, just as the Roman thrust at him with his sword, so that the captain staggered forward on to the next man following, which was Wolfkettle, the eager warrior, who thrust him through with his sword and shoved him aside as they all strode into the hall together. Albeit, no sword fell from the Roman captain as he fell, for Theodolf's side bore it into the hall of the wolflings. Most wrathful were those men, and went hastily, for their roof was full of smoke, and the flames flickered about the pillars and the wall here and there, and crept up to the windows aloft. Yet was it not wholly or fiercely burning, for the Roman fire-raisers had been hurried and hasty in their work. Straight away then, Steinulf and Granny led the others off at a run towards the loft and the water. But Theodolf, who went slowly and painfully, looked and beheld on the dais those men bound for the burning, and he went quietly, and as a man who has been sick and is weak, up to the dais, and said, Be of good cheer, O brothers, for the kindreds have vanquished the foemen, and the end of strife is come. His voice sounded strange and sweet to them amidst the turmoil of the fight without. He laid down his sword on the table, and drew a little sharp knife from his girdle, and cut their bonds one by one, and loosed them with his blood-stained hands. And each one, as he loosed him, he kissed and said to him, Brother, go help those who are quenching the fire. This is the bidding of the war duke. But as he loosed one after another, he was longer and longer about it, and his words were slower. At last he came to the man who was bound in his own high seat, close under the place of the wondrous lamp, the hall sun, and he was the only one left bound. That man was of the Wormings, and was named Elfric. He loosed him, and was long about it, and when he was done he smiled on him and kissed him and said to him, Arise, brother, go help the quenchers of the fire, and leave to me this my chair, for I am weary, and if thou wilt, thou mayest bring me of that water to drink. For this morning men have forgotten the mead of the reapers. Then Elfric arose, and Theodolf sat in his chair, and leaned back his head. But Elfric looked at him for a moment as one scared, and then ran his ways down the hall, which now was growing noisy with the hurry and bustle of the quenchers of the fire, to whom had divers others joined themselves. Then there, from a bucket, which was still for a moment, he filled a wooden bowl, which he caught up from the base of one of the hall pillars, and hastened up the hall again, and there was no man nigh the dais, and Theodolf yet sat in his chair, and the hall was dim with the rolling smoke, and Elfric saw not well what the war-duke was doing. 
Yet he hastened on, and when he was close to Theodolf, he trod in something wet, and his heart sank, for he knew that it was blood. His foot slipped therewith, and as he put out his hand to save himself, the more part of the water was spilled and mingled with the blood. But he went up to Theodolf, and said to him, Drink, war duke. Here hath come a mouthful of water. But Theodolf moved not for his word, and Elfric touched him, and he moved none the more. Then Elfric's heart failed him, and he laid his hand on the war duke's hand, and looked closely into his face, and the hand was cold, and the face ashen pale, and Elfric laid his hand on his side, and he felt the short sword of the Roman leader thrust deep therein, besides his many other hurts. So Elfric knew that he was dead, and he cast the bowl to the earth, and lifted up his hands, and wailed out aloud, like a woman who hath come suddenly on her dead child, and cried out in a great voice, Hither, hither, O men in this hall, for the war duke of the Martman is dead. O ye people, hearken, Theodolf the mighty, the wolfing, is dead. And he was a young man, and weak with the binding, and the waiting for death. And he bowed himself adown, and crouched on the ground, and wept aloud. But even as he cried that cry, the sunlight outside the man's door was darkened, and the hall sun came over the threshold in her ancient gold-embroidered raiment, holding in her hand her namesake, the wondrous lamp, and the spears and the war-gear of warriors gleamed behind her. But the men tarried on the threshold till she turned about and beckoned to them, and then they poured in through the man's door, their war-gear rent, and they all befouled and disarrayed with the battle, but with proud and happy faces, as they entered, she waved her hand to them, to bid them go join the quenchers of the fire. So they went their ways. But she went with unfaltering steps up to the dais, and the place where the chain of the lamp hung down from amidst the smoke cloud, wavering a little in the gusts of the hall. Straight away she made the lamp fast to its chain, and dealt with its pulleys with a deft hand often practiced therein, and then let it run up toward the smoke-hidden roof, till it gleamed in its due place once more, a token of the salvation of the wolfings and the welfare of all the kindreds. Then she turned towards Theodolf, with a calm and solemn face, though it was very pale, and looked as if she would not smile again. Elfric had risen up, and was standing by the board, speechless and the passion of sobs, still struggling in his bosom. She put him aside gently, and went up to Theodolf, and stood above him, and looked down on his face a while. Then she put forth her hand, and closed his eyes, and stooped down, and kissed his face. Then she stood up again, and faced the hall, and looked and saw that many were streaming in, and that though the smoke was still eddying overhead the fire was well nigh quenched within and without the sound of battle had sunk and died away for indeed the markmen had ended their day's work before noontide that day and the more part of the romans were slain and to the rest they had given peace till the folk moat should give doom concerning them for pity of these valiant men was growing in the hearts of the valiant men who had vanquished them, now that they feared them no more. And this second part of the morning battle is called Theodolf's Storm. So now, when the hall sun looked and beheld that the battle was done, and the fire quenched, and when she saw how every man that came into the hall looked up and beheld the wondrous lamp, and his face quickened into joy at the sight of it, and how most looked up at the high seat, and Theodolf lying lean back therein, her heart nigh broke between the thought of her grief and of the grief of the folk that their mighty friend was dead, and the thought of the joy of the days to be, and all the glory that his latter days had won. But she gathered heart, and casting back the dark tresses of her hair, she lifted up her voice and cried out till its clear shrillness sounded throughout all the roof. O men in this hall, the war duke is dead. O people, hearken, for Theodolf the mighty hath changed his life. Come hither, O men, come hither, for this is true, that Theodolf is dead. End of chapter 29